So, uh, Elena, thanks for having me here. Um, about 10 years ago, when I was here at Sloan, we were honoring Dr. Coit, and Elena was just a baby uh, starting out, and now it's very impressive to see what a guru she turned into. And that's not just a credit to Elena, but a credit to the mentors like David Ilson that help people grow like that. And I'm sure Karen uh, can say the same thing based on what she's seeing here. And it's also a treat because you get to see people who you worked with when you were here. One of my idols, Alan Turnbull, is back there who is a, a guru in his own right, and my old boss, Murray Brennan. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And basically, I'm just going to, because I realize the majority in this audience are not surgeons. So I'm just going to tell you what I think you need to know about esophageal cancer. So the goal of surgery is to remove all of the disease with the surrounding tissue and to get rid of the lymph nodes. That's the easy part. The hard part is creating a conduit so that the patient can eat afterwards. If you could just take out that cancer and bring out a spit fistula, most of those patients would do infinitely better, but they have to eat. It's a basic function of human life. So just to go over the anatomy a little bit, over here you have an esophageal cancer. And when I, we say on block, it means resecting the structures that are being invaded with that cancer. So it's not just taking out the esophagus, but if the esophagus is involving part of the diaphragm, the crus, you cut that with it. It's usually not going to invade the vena cava, but it's usually going to invade the pericardium. If it's an invading part of that pericardium, you resect that with it. If it's invading the aorta, technically that's not resectable. There's things you can do in that situation. But that's the definition of the on block resection. And then you have the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are very important. Even though the staging system uh, sort of states that the more lymph nodes that you have that are positive, that's bad. Yeah, really? We know that, you know, but that's what the staging system shows. And there are two sets of lymph nodes that you have to think about, the lymph nodes in the abdomen and the lymph nodes in the chest. So the lymph nodes in the abdomen, um, it's very similar to what you do for gastric cancer. And there's always been debate between D2, D1 resections. And my sense is that it, the more lymph nodes you can get out of there, the better. So when you're resecting the uh, lymph nodes along the left gastric, the splenic, uh, I think that is appropriate. Now, I got to tell you, I don't go into the hilum of the spleen to get those nodes out. Now, maybe when Dan Coit's doing a gastrectomy, that that's what he does. I usually go down to the left gastric, the celiac, sweep a little of the splenic, maybe a little bit of the hepatic. But I don't go crazy in either direction. And in the chest, the most important thing are to get the lymph nodes that are surrounding the esophagus. So here you have the esophagus in the back. The azagous vein is going over it. You have your level four nodes. You have your level seven nodes, eight, nine nodes. Uh, the four and the seven nodes really drain the lung. It's the level eight and the nine nodes that are really uh, draining the uh, esophagus. So you also want to direct where you're focusing your attention. <clears throat> And so once you've done your anatomic resection and you've gotten your lymph nodes, the next step is to think about conduit. And conduit goes hand in hand with the type of cancer operation that you need to do. Since we're talking about GE junction tumors, it's important to understand the Seward classification. Seward 1, it behaves more like an esophageal tumor. Seward 3, it behaves more like a gastric tumor. And Seward 2 <clears throat> is somewhere in the middle. And the importance of that is that as you go down on the stomach, you're going to need more and more of a margin. And with that more and more margin that you need, you need to tailor your operation. If you have to take a lot of stomach, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to bring that stomach up into the neck. So most of these operations for the GE junction are best done through the stomach and the right chest because it lets you get a margin on either side. And the on block, hopefully, should take care of that circumferential margin that you're concerned about. So the conduit considerations. When you're a medical oncologist and you're looking at a patient with esophageal cancer, look at their belly. 
look at their chest because that's going to show you if they've had prior surgery. If they've had a Bill Roth before and had their stomach removed, that's going to change the type of operation you can do. If they've had a colon resection, that may influence the type of conduit that you can use. So the surgical scars really let you know what you're in for. And it's not just the conduit that you're looking at, but when you have a patient who has an abdomen or a chest full of scars, that can injure the blood supply when you go in there to resect. You can injure the blood supply to the colon, the blood supply to the stomach, and that will affect the type of operation you do. Like I said, the resection is the easy part. It's making sure that you have a conduit that's sturdy, that has a good blood supply, that's not going to leak, that's going to really affect the quality of life of that patient. And then the various conduits you can use, stomach, colon, small bowel, and the thing that you can't discount is the patient's body habitus. At Mount Sinai, we have patients who have high BMI. They have to sign a special consent form. I'm not sure if that's been adopted here at Sloan as well, but there's a special consent form when your BMI, I think, is above 28. So this is the blood supply. This is the right gastroepiploic artery, which you want to preserve. This is the back side of it. And I also like to preserve that right gastric artery. Many times they will describe, oh, you can just take the right gastric artery. What I found is that right gastric artery is the difference between a leak or not a leak. And then if you need to, if your stomach's been burned, go ahead and do your colon interposition as well. And the different approaches, for GE junction, without any complications of the conduit, I think in Ivor Lewis where you use the belly and the chest is the best approach. Left thoracal abdominal, sometimes if you have a, a conduit that is inadequate, you can do a, a Ruin Y uh, small bowel uh, in the left chest. The three hole is where we go belly, chest, and neck. Transhiatal, where you bluntly dissect in the mediastinum. I'm not crazy about that operation. Uh, and then you have the MIE uh, robotic type of operation that we'll talk about a little bit. So we've heard about the CROSS trial. Basically, chemo rads before surgery for advanced disease. I want to focus on the surgical results here for a minute. When you look at the chemo rads group and the surgery group, the thing that stands out the most is an astomotic leak. Like I explained before, this is the biggest problem that we deal with when we're dealing with these types of cancers. So for the chemo rads group, it was 22%. For the surgery alone group, it was 30%. And this is generally what's reflected out there. Maybe in the higher side, I, I kind of think we do a better job than this, but this is pretty accurate. When you look at the data from Sloan Kettering, which Nabil Risk uh, did a great job of here, when you look at uh, 858 patients, this was published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, leak rate was 21%, 30-day mortality rate was 6%. This is probably the gold standard out there in thoracic surgery. The most interesting finding in this paper was the role of complications on outcome. If you had a complication, you had a greater chance of dying from your malignancy in the long term. So if you had a stage one cancer and you had a stage one who had a leak, a stage one who didn't have a leak, the one who didn't have a leak would live longer. And that's very interesting from a biological standpoint. So where do we go with esophageal operations? How do you minimize complications so they can have a longer survival, i.e. leak? So this is from the University of Pittsburgh, Jim Lukatich, where he looked at 1,000 patients, and maybe we found the answer here. His leak rate is 5%. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we need to do minimally invasive surgery, because if that could lead to a leak rate of 5% and an operative mortality of 1.7%, maybe that's what we should be doing. What's interesting is when I really dissect this paper, I see a lot of exclusions. A lot of exclusions of patients who should be included as an intent to treat analysis. So it seems like the patients at higher risk, more difficult cases, cases that were converted, are kind of excluded. You have a couple in there, but I'm not entirely happy with the methodology of this paper. 
Now you have Robert Serfolio down at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. This was his initial paper looking at robotic esophagectomy where he looked at 22 cases. Leak rate was two. Operative mortality was zero. So maybe he was on to something. And I give him credit because he published his subsequent study of 85 patients where he had a leak rate of 6.5%, 30-day operative mortality of 3.5%, but a 90-day mortality of 11%. And that usually was the result of some type of conduit complication. Complication, which leads to poor oncologic outcome. Something to think about while we're trying to minimize the incisions. Then let's look at the memorial data. Netu Sarkaria published this paper several years ago where he looked at 21 patients performed with minimally invasive esophagectomy using the robot. Leak rate was 14%, TE fistula, 14%, one death. So when your complication rate is in the 20s and you have TE fistulae that are forming where you need to uh, disconnect the patient, is that because the robot was used? Is it because of uh, the surgeon? So there's certain things that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to consider how do we minimize that leak rate? Is minimally invasive esophagectomy really what we need to minimize that complication rate? So this is the technique that they used. And when you look at the technique in the abdomen, there are six holes there. They're presented as little dots, but, you know, 12 millimeters, 8 millimeters, the incisions are a little bigger than just little dots. And my concern is when you add all those dots up, it's about the same as a midline laparotomy incision. So in my mind, that's the similar amount of trauma. When you look at the chest, you've got five of those little dots again in the picture. But when you put those together, that's the size of the thoracotomy incision. So my question was, is there really a difference with the minimally invasive compared to the open from a quality of life standpoint? So we did a study at Mount Sinai where we looked at quality of life comparing open to minimally invasive esophagectomy. And many can argue about the science involved in quality of life studies, and I get it. I'm not sure if I'm a believer in it. But this is what we found. It was all over the place. Some MIEs did great, some MIEs did poorly. Some opens did great, some opens did poorly. And at six months, it really didn't change. So the summary of this study was that the potential benefits in global and mental health status uh, with minimally invasive surgery should be considered with caution given the possibility of publication and selection bias. The thing I, for I forgot to mention was that when we were going through this study and looking up all these papers, again, the exclusions were the things that weren't being taken into account. Patients who were uh, opened, who were morbidly obese, who had more complications, who would generally do worse from a quality of life standpoint, just in general, were consistently excluded from the MIE group. The major complications that you want to capture are leak, conduit necrosis, tracheoesophageal fistula, injury to the blood supply of the conduit. There are deaths that occur, but you don't see them in the literature. Deaths from injury to the aorta, deaths from injury in the abdomen to the cava, but you just don't read about it. They're not published. You know, if you don't know your history, then you're doomed to repeat it. So we lived this when I was here at Sloan where we published two major papers on minimally invasive lung surgery, vatslobectomy. And we found it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Survival, recurrence was the same, lower morbidity, lower hospital stay, lower cost. And I was so proud of these two papers. And then, when we kept talking about things in conferences and stuff, I started to realize we missed a ton of complications. When you do these types of studies and they're not done in the setting of a prospective study like the cross study, etc., you tend to miss things. And it's not done on purpose. 
It's just the methodology of the way we gather data. So what I found is that I had to specifically look for those complications. And when we looked, and I'm sure we missed some more, we found 13 major complications. So I felt compelled to publish this paper, which demonstrated our catastrophic complications of VAT slobectomy. And what's interesting, and you know, and I take complete responsibility for this, is that when you look in the morbidity of those two big papers, which had like 600, paper, 600 patients, these patients are not included. And if we did this inadvertently, I am sure many other groups do this inadvertently as well. And these aren't just small complications like atrial fibrillation. This is a list of the complications. We had three people that required a pneumonectomy, where they're, you're going in there for a lobectomy and they needed a pneumonectomy, splenectomy, empyemas. So these are not small complications. So if you're doing 100 patients and you're doing VATS lobectomies on them, and you're doing these small incisions, which really aren't that small to begin with, and sometimes you do have to put a little hurting on the uh, intercostal nerve that's there. Is it worth doing those 100 patients if you have one or two patients that are gonna require a pneumonectomy? It just shows we need to be a little more judicial in, uh, judicious in how we do things. And we need to take into account that sometimes, even though we think we're doing things in the patient's best interest, minimally invasively, it actually may not be. And maybe the best minimally invasive surgeon is not the one that's technically so gifted, but the one who knows when to open. So in general, in the literature, complications are underreported, especially the bad ones. And those are the ones that are gonna hurt our patients. So, What's driving MIE? What's driving the robotics? Is it patient outcome? I haven't seen data that suggests that it's so much better. Not from a quality of life standpoint, not from a mortality standpoint. If anything, I've seen a lot of complications that I don't think you would have had when you did it open. Is it academic recognition? I know we've been in, we're all in that position as academicians. Are we doing this because it's good for our career, or are we doing this because it's really good for the patient? And we have to constantly check ourselves to be sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. And that's not easy. And that's why it's easier when you're at a, a, an institution like Sloan, when you have 10 partners where you can dissipate these complications that aren't only hurtful for the patients, but they're embarrassing to surgeons. We don't want to admit when we've done something to harm somebody. So, it really depends on institutions like this to publish results that are really gonna affect outcome because you really are influencing the, the way surgeons practice and influencing indirectly the outcomes of patients. But is there money involved? Is there marketing? What, what, is there any other thing that could be driving this robotic uh, phase that we're going through? Well, let's look at US healthcare costs. The U.S. health, health uh, expenditures are $3.3 trillion, 18% of our GDP. Let's put that in perspective. Defense spending is 3% of our GDP. Huge number. Now, do we need to go through some details? PSA, that's a trillion dollar industry. Drugs, $74 billion spent on drugs that did not extend life, not by a single day. 100 billion were spent on cancer drugs, but 74% of that spent on drugs that didn't extend life by a single day. So let's look at, from the money standpoint, Intuitive Surgical, a $62 billion company. That is not chopped liver. Apple, 900 billion. This is 1 14th of Apple. So you cannot discount the influence of this big company in trying to get people to use the robot. So what does the robot add? In my opinion, time and money, but not safety. So in conclusion, uh, the basics for advanced cancer, when you have a cancer, chemo rads first, on block resection, nodal dissection, and you have to really be careful and think about what kind of conduit you're gonna use, especially if you see scars on their chest and, be uh, and belly. 
And what we want to do for long-term outcome and short-term outcome is minimize complications, not just incisions. Once we can minimize these complications, then we can start focusing on what kind of an incision we can make to minimize it. Because from the quality of life standpoint, it's not making that much of a difference. And beware of these outside influences. You know, Intuitive has a list of what they call influencers, opinion leaders, and they target them. They try to get them to use the robot. They also have institutions that they look at. If we get this institution to buy into the robot, our stock's going to soar. Be careful. Thank you.